September, last week we started on a new series of prophets. Now when Pastor Tony and I were talking about this, he said, so I'm thinking about doing a three-week series on the minor prophets. I'm like, okay, that sounds good. And I'm going to be gone one week of it. <laughs> and I said, okay, that sounds good. And, uh, and he said, and you get Haggai. <laughs> okay, I think that sounds good. I'm not real sure. How many of you read Haggai normally as a rule in your daily devotions? See, I'm not seeing that. Okay. Well, anyway, before we start that, quick quiz for anyone who, who was listening last week. Why are the minor prophets called the minor prophets? Can anybody tell me that? Janice said they're short. They are. They're called the minor prophets simply because... They're very small. They're very short books. So there's that. A reminder. And then Pastor Tony, I think, issued a challenge last week, didn't he, for anyone who could quote the books of the Bible? Who could, who could recite those? Uh, I'll put your name down and tell him that he owes you a $2 bill if you can do it for me this morning. Anybody want to give it a shot? Need more time. Need more time. All right. Keep cramming. I've got a song I can teach to you. That might help, but the only drawback to that is every time I want to know where a book of the Bible is, I have to start at the beginning and sing it all the way through in my head. So it's it's a little bit of a pain, but, uh, but it works. I taught it to kids a long time ago, and it's still there. So anyway, but yes, so that challenge is still out there. If you can, if you can recite the books of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, it's worth $2. Keep studying it could buy you a Coke or coffee. So, you know, work on it. Anyway, we're still working on this series. I didn't know that was a book of the Bible. And today we are doing the book of Haggai. So let's take a quick overview here. It was written in 520 BC. And Haggai is very meticulous in, in how he dated it. So there's really no doubt about when it was written. Uh, it was written 18 years after the Jews returned from exile. And we're all very familiar, we're, at least we're more familiar, with the accounts in Ezra and Nehemiah talking about the rebuilding of the wall than, than we are with Haggai. But it uh, talks about the condition of Jerusalem when the Jews were allowed to return. And we'll look at that a little bit more in depth in a little bit. Um, now it's believed from his writings that he had seen Jerusalem before the destruction because of some of some of the rec um, references that he has in there. And so if this is the case, that would make him probably over 70 when, when he wrote these prophecies. And so he was an older man. From some of the things that he says, some people think he may have been a priest as well. And he was looking back on the glory days of Jerusalem and remembering what he had seen. He'd seen the good old days, and he wanted to see his people reclaim what he knew that God had in store for him, and for them. And so the book of Haggai consists of, it's two chapters. If you, We could read the whole thing today, but I'm not going to do that. Uh, it consists of two chapters, and it's made up of four prophetic messages. It's divided very clearly into four sections. And, uh, and like we said... The reason it's considered a minor prophet is because it is a very short book. So one thing that makes it very unique, though, if you remember from reading any of the prophets, it's this, it seems like a non-ending cycle of God tells them what they should do, they repent, but then they go back and they, they sin again, or they don't obey him in the first place. One of the things that makes the book of Haggai unique is the people actually listen and they follow God's instructions. So that is, that's notable. So let's take a quick look at the history leading up to Haggai's messages from God. Um, first we're going to look at the book of Ezra a little bit because it gives us some insight into the condition of Jerusalem and the project of rebuilding the temple. And uh, Travis has a slide up there, but I'm going to read. I should have put a little bit more on there, Travis. So I'm going to read before we get to that. Just leave it there because I'll come to it. The Jews were in the process of rebuilding the temple. If you remember, Ezra and Nehemiah kind of started that process. Well, 
as often happens, there were some people who didn't like that. And they decided they'd cause some trouble for them. And they wrote a letter. This is the text of the letter they sent to him. To King Artaxerxes from your servants, the men from the region west of the Euphrates River, let it be known to the king that the Jews who came from you have returned to us at Jerusalem. They are rebuilding that rebellious and evil city, finishing its walls and repairing its foundations. How dare you? Let it now be known to the king that if that city is rebuilt and its walls are finished, they will not pay tribute, duty, or land tax, and the royal revenue will suffer. So you're letting these people rebuild and they're not going to pay taxes or anything. Since we have taken an oath of loyalty to the king, and it is not right for us to witness his dishonor, we have sent to inform the king that a search should be made in your father's record books. In these record books, you will discover and verify that the city is a rebellious city, harmful to kings and provinces. There have been revolts in it since ancient times. That is why this city was destroyed. We advise the king that if this city is rebuilt and its walls are finished, you will not have any possessions west of the Euphrates. So they really didn't want the city rebuilt. And so here's the response from King Artaxerxes. And this is... I didn't put the whole thing on the slide. Oh, go back, Travis. He answered, after your letter was translated and read to me, I had the old records checked. It is true that for years Jerusalem has rebelled and caused trouble for other kings and nations. And so he said, I want you to command the people to stop rebuilding the city until I give further notice. And the Jews were forced to stop work on the temple and were not able to do any more building until the year after Darius became king of Persia. So that brings us to where we are now. They had started rebuilding the temple, but their enemies didn't like it, and so they took steps to stop it. And, you know, maybe on the part of the Jews, you can say there's a little bit of a lack of commitment here, too, because they encountered some opposition. They didn't say, no, God has commanded us to do this. They said, okay, I guess we have to stop. They said they said stop, so they stopped. So they were left with only a foundation. They got the foundation done, and it was a good foundation, but it needed a lot more work because it wasn't a temple that could be used to worship God, which is what God had in mind. And uh, so God brought Haggai into the picture to get their attention. Let's take a look at that. So he told Governor Zerubbabel, and the high priest Joshua, that the Lord All-Powerful had said to them and to the people, You say this isn't the right time to build a temple for me. But is it right for you to live in expensive houses while my temple is a pile of ruins? Just look at what is happening. You harvest less than you plant. You never have enough to eat or drink. Your clothes don't keep you warm. And your wages are stored in bags full of holes. So what Haggai is saying here is you, know, you are taking care of yourselves really well. Look around you. You're, you're doing a really good job taking care of yourselves. But what's going on? Or have you been obedient? He's pointing out the disobedience and he's pointing out the consequences of that. And he's encouraging the Jews to finish what they've started. They've done a, done a really good job of taking care of their own personal material needs. But they've neglected God's house, leaving it in a pile of ruins. They haven't finished it. They haven't been obedient, and he makes it clear to them that they have deprived themselves of the blessings that God wants to give them. So now the leaders of the Jewish people have been confronted with God's message, and they have a decision to make. They can either obey, or they can continue in their ways. So let's take a look now at what they decide. Then the governor Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, and the high priest, Joshua, son of Jehoshaphat, there will be a test on that later, and all the people with them listened, really listened to the voice of their God. When God sent the prophet Haggai to them, they paid attention to him. In listening to Haggai, they honored God. Then Haggai, God's messenger, preached God's message to the people. I must have dragged something with my thumb on my laptop. Preach God's message to the people. I am with you. God's word. This is how God got Zerubbabel 
Joshua, and all the people moving. So when they obey, well, let me go back. In the Jews' response to Haggai, after all these, all these prof prophetic messages and warnings, generation after generation, and after a lot of experiences of logical consequences, how many are familiar with logical consequences as parents? Okay, you don't want to wear your coat today? Okay, but it's 30 degrees. You'll figure it out. Um, you don't want to obey me? And I'm the God who blesses you and helps your crops to grow? Okay, you'll figure it out. Um, anyway, after experiencing logical consequences for a while, we finally see the Jews listen and obey. And in response, and as a reassurance, God promises them that his presence will be with them as they follow. And um, Travis, go ahead one slide. I think this, no, go back. Okay. But God tells them, I will be with you. I want you to obey me. I want you to rebuild the temple. My presence will be with you. And the strangest thing happened when they started obeying. They were working together and they were obeying God. And through the physical act of rebuilding the temple in obedience to God's instructions, this is where the weird part comes in. They stopped looking at themselves and their own needs, and they started looking around them, and they started focusing on God. And they started caring about something greater than themselves. God has a way of doing that when we start working together and we start obeying Him. And then God was able to shower his blessings on them. Now we're ready for that. And God can work with people who listen and obey. He can work with that kind of person. He can use and bless people who focus on him rather than on themselves. So that gives us a look at what was going on in Haggai, the prophecy of Haggai. But as you know, on the front of your bulletin, you see, love God, love others. And Jesus said, all the law and the prophets hang on those two commandments. Well, Haggai's a prophet, so, you know, in Pastor Tony's and, and my conversation, we said, okay, the important thing about these prophets is to bring them then into how Jesus would apply the truth in them. So what does Jesus have to say to us from the book of Haggai? What does that mean? Susan, did you really bring us here today just to tell us this story from a minor prophet? No. Well, what does it have to do with love God, love others? Hang in there. All right, so let's take a look at how to bring it into focus and find a way to apply it. Now, I started thinking about this, and I started thinking about two years ago, right, about, right, right before Pastor Tony and Trevor came, we were celebrating our 75th anniversary. How many of you remember that? That was a lot of fun, wasn't it, Terry? We, we sat in so many meetings and we talked about so many things. And it was, it was really cool for me because even though I feel like I've been in this church forever because you guys have, have sucked us in and made us part of your family, we've only been here four years. And so at that point, especially two years ago, I was really new, but it was... It was so interesting and, and so cool to hear you talking about the good old days, the glory days of Old Hickory, which I don't think are gone, but uh, remembering the things that had happened in the past and talking about when so-and-so was pastor and, and when so-and-so was here and when they used to sing and when all these different things happened. And, uh, and I felt pride in that too, even though I'm a, a very new member of the family. It's like, yeah, you know, and and talking about people who came out of this church family, names like like Dan Boone, David Graves, and so many more that we would recognize if we started listing them. And and like I said, I started feeling a sense of pride as we talked, and, and I don't think it was wrong pride. I just there is that feeling of, wow, look what God has done here. And look how he has worked. And, and if we take that even more, more personal to our own personal lives, we each have a story we can tell. 
about where we've come from and how we've come up in the faith and uh, and our good old days. If I had time, and actually I probably do, somebody told me that they like it when I preach because we always get out earlier. Um, but I won't do it. If we had time, I would pull a few people up here and, and let you tell your faith story. And it would be really fun to hear that. And it would be it would be humbling to hear how God has worked. You've kind of heard a little bit of mine. I've talked about you know, being the youngest of seven and my mom cramming all of us into a, into a pickup truck and driving us to church. And, uh, and that has stuck with me, you know, and, and I have that foundation of knowing that whatever's going on, and my kids know, if it needs to be prayed for and grandma's on it, they're probably good. You know, there's, there's that feeling. But, uh, you know, when we think about, when we think about those foundations, those good old days, we get very humbled, and we're very grateful. And, uh, and I'm sure that nearly everybody in this room could testify to somebody in our past to have helped give us a strong start in our faith and a foundation to build on. And we are very, very blessed in that regard. Just like the people in Haggai's day, we have a good foundation. And we've grown on that. We are indeed a people of privilege. But as it's been said, with great privilege comes what? Great responsibility. And so our responsibility is to build on that. Our responsibility is to continue growing and to become an active disciple of Jesus Christ. And if we are an active disciple of Jesus Christ, to become an even more active disciple of Jesus Christ. Because our growth never stops. We never get there. God always wants us to continue knowing Him more and growing more with Him. And so our responsibility is to build on that foundation that was established for us by those who have gone before us and who have helped prepare the way. So let's take a look at what Jesus had to say about it. Aha. This is not the updated PowerPoint. Uh, let me let me pull it here. Paul said this, and we'll read it, because it's important also. God was kind and let me become an expert builder. I laid a foundation on which others have built. But we must each be careful how we build because Christ is the only foundation. Whatever we build on that foundation will be tested by fire on the day of judgment. We will be rewarded if our building is left standing. All of you surely know that you are God's temple and that His Spirit lives in you. This goes along perfectly with what Jesus had to say, actually. Jesus also said, anyone who hears these words of mine, and you're very familiar with the scripture, anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on rock. And the rain came and the storms fell and the winds beat against the house. But the house stood firm because it had its foundation on the rock. Likewise, if you hear these words of mine and you do not put them into practice, you're like what? A foolish man who built his house on sand. The rains came, the storms came, the winds blew and beat against the house, and it fell with a great crash because it did not have a firm foundation. And so Jesus wants us to build on the strong foundation of him. The foundation that's been laid for us, this very good foundation that's been laid by those who came before us in the faith who taught us and our relationship with Jesus Christ. But we're not done, right? We've still got some growing to do. So our responsibility is to be the kind of people God can work with. People who hear his words, put them into practice. More than that, people who read his words and apply them in our own lives. People who open ourselves up and allow God to take us deeper, much deeper than we've ever gone before. People who aren't afraid to do that, no matter what it looks like, because we know that the God we serve is a God who would never ask us to do anything he's not gonna provide strength for. If he asks us to do something, he's already ahead of us setting everything up, paving the way, so it can be possible. And 
I firmly believe that God is calling us to live that way. And as a natural outgrowth of that relationship with Him, you know what you're going to find out? It's just like in, in the day of the Jews in Haggai. All of a sudden you're going to look around and realize this really weird thing has happened. You looked out away from yourself and you're going to realize that you love other people. And that you're concerned about them. And that won't be a chore because it will become a part of your spiritual nature. You'll just naturally care about other people. And, and you do. I'm not saying this isn't happening. But we'll be less concerned. I think God is always calling us to be less concerned with our agendas and much more open to His agenda. And when that happens, that's when change can truly take place in our own life, in our families, here in our church, in Old Hickory, and all around. Because God can work with that kind of person. God can work with people who listen and obey. Now, a few weeks ago, John Juniman was here, and he preached an awesome sermon about discipleship. And, and I have to confess, when he was up here talking, I thought, he's had a conversation with Pastor Tony. Did you think that? I, I really did. And, and I asked Tony later, I'm like, did you talk to him before he came? And he's like, no. What did he talk about? And, uh, and he talked so much about, and so eloquently, about how we need to be growing as disciples. And every one of us needs to be growing as disciples. God is calling every one of us to pick this up, pick up your phone, you may have it on your phone, and read his word. Find out more about what he has to say. Ask him what he's saying to you and what he wants you to do. And so I thought about, I thought about that message that John delivered as I was reading through Haggai this week because I do think that he's calling us to a deeper level. And I think he's calling us to grow deeper, get our roots planted a lot firmer so that we can reach out a lot farther. Now I had somebody tell me once, it was, he was a science teacher, and not the one I'm married to, a different science teacher. Um, but he was telling me that a tree, when a tree grows, the distance that the roots branch out, I don't know if you guys know this, the distance that the roots branch out under the ground is equal to the distance that the leaves extend. Okay, so when it rains, the drip line waters the roots. All right. So when you look at a tree and you see this big tree, then picture underneath the ground how far out the roots are spreading. And um, and I thought of that that image when I was when I was thinking about growing. We need to get those roots way out. Get get our roots very strong, very firm, very far out of God, so that we can reach out that far too, to his people, and bring more people in for him. But to do that, again, that means listening, obeying, and becoming a person God can work with. So my challenge to you today is become that kind of person.